How many of you have read a public budget? Raise your hand if you've read a public budget. OK, hands down. How many of you understood it? Yeah, three. <laughs> you know, budgeting by department, when, when an outsider looks at it, 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 it doesn't mean a lot. But these budgets, if you organize them by outcome, they're really clear. This is one page from the 2003, the budget passed in 2003 by Washington State on health care. It summarizes their major decisions. There were pages behind this with, with other smaller programs, but this is the big ones. Here's what we could afford to produce better health. Here are the big decisions we made we can't afford this year, which included recommending removing 60,000 people from health insurance. It was tough, 14% shortfall. But a citizen can read that page, and they understand the guts of what, what decisions their leaders are making. In 10 pages, a citizen can understand the basic decisions in the budget. They're in totally transparent. So what do you get? You get a balanced budget without gimmicks, if you've done it honestly. You get all the energy focused on what to keep, not what to cut. It reverses that energy, because the cuts are just what fall below the line. The real energy goes into what's most important, what would produce the best results. And again, you're focusing on results, not costs. Last, if I'm a program manager, I know that last year's costs are irre irrelevant. Citizens don't care about my costs. They don't give a whit. They want results. If you do it right, you solicit more offers than you can fund so that you will automatically eliminate the lowest value things that your government does every year, just like a well-run business. You know, you folks, you folks find that, that lowest value 5 to 10% every year and do away with it so you can invest in R&D and innovation and what you need for the future. Government never does that, but it's built into this system. The politics of new investments change. Rather than squeezing them in after everything else has been funded, they just get ranked. And if they're promising, they're ranked high. So they're on a level playing field. The politics of special interests changes a little. In Washington state, they, the budget included a recommendation. Well, let me back up. The citizens had passed a referendum or initiative saying to reduce class sizes and another to increase teacher pay. And the education team looked at it, and the research says neither of those, at the level they were talking about, will impacts student achievement. So they said, we're going to spend new money to do something that doesn't work while we cut old things that we know work. Doesn't make sense. The, the legislature has the power to suspend an initiative or referendum in Washington state. So the governor recommended that. And of course, when it came out in the budget, 20,000 teachers showed up on the state house lawn for a rational discourse about education policy. <laughs> and when their union leader testified before the relevant committee, or committees in the legislature, I remember one, one senator said, you know, we would like to fund this. We agree with you. We'd like to give teachers a raise. So help us out. Tell us, what would you take from above the line and move it below the line so we can move your program up. And why would that produce better results? He wouldn't answer the question. That's the question you want at budget hearings. That's the right debate. It also creates accountability. If I'm running a program and I know that if I can't document results, good results for the dollar, it will go away, I'm truly accountable. And that makes me very motivated to look for continuous improvement and to constantly find ways to do it better, faster, cheaper. And finally, as a bonus, these budgets, as I showed you, are comprehensible to every citizen. So they get great press. We were stunned in Washington state. I mean, they were cutting 14%. There was blood on the floor, and the press was incredibly positive because of the process that was used. Now, I think the real reason is these were the first budgets that the reporters ever understood. But whatever it was, the press on these things is, is very positive. So it it's, gives you a common sense communications tool to, to tell the citizens, here are our priorities, and here, here's how we're spending our money, and these are the sacrifices we're making this year. So that's budgeting. Now, 
reinventing public institutions. As I said, public education and health care are the two biggest sources of spending. So let's talk about public education. You heard this morning at the panel, our schools, there's a new report out, our schools are falling further and further behind our competitors around the world. Um, and if you look carefully, our schools work for about half the kids. You know, they work for my kids, and I bet they work for most of your kids. But 30% of the students drop out, 10% go to private school, 1% to 2% are homeschooled, and then there's some other percentage that, who knows, that actually gets a high school diploma, but doesn't have much in the way of skills that back it up and can't really compete in the, in the workforce. You add all that up, you're, you're somewhere around 50%. Now, that's an incredible indictment, an incredible indictment. But it's also an incredible opportunity. Look at the productivity improvements that are just waiting to happen, 50%. I'm sure we can't get the schools working for 100% of the kids. Some of the kids have developmental problems, et cetera, but certainly more than 50%. So I believe that for those other 50%, the key is different models of schools. Because, again, my kids did fine sitting at a desk in a row, using books, hearing lectures, taking information in, putting it back out on tests, writing papers. My kids can do that. But not all kids do well that way. Kids learn in lots of different ways. Some kids are experiential learners, and they need to be doing things to learn. Some kids are totally turned on by technology, and if, they can, if that can be the center of their educational process, they will just run with it. Some kids by performing arts. Some kids by something else. Then there are kids who come to school without motivation. I have a very good friend named Doug Ross, who runs four charter schools in inner-city Detroit. And before he started the first one, he did a year of research. And what his research told him was that the, the biggest problem in the inner city is our schools assume a motivated student, and these students aren't motivated. You know, my kids are motivated. They know they're going to college. And so when they have to do algebra or geometry or some abstract thing in middle school, well, they, they buckle down and do it because it's a road to college. But in the inner city, those kids, have, they've never met anybody who went to college other than their teachers. In their communities, people don't go to college. Their parents didn't go to college. They know they're not going to college. And so they do OK in elementary school. Then middle school, they hit abstraction. They hit algebra or Shakespeare or something. And they just, why would you learn that? What is the point? and they begin a slide and then drop out of high school. And so Doug figured, my job is to motivate these kids. So the first morning of the first day of school, every year he has an assembly with all the kids and all their parents, and he tells them they're all going to college. And then when they get to middle school, they do a lot of field trips to businesses to see what it's like, see all those college-educated people. In high school, they have to spend two days a week in internships at businesses or nonprofits or government offices so that they see African-American people who look just like them, wearing suits and ties, having nice houses, nice cars, nice jobs, because they went to college. And Doug's schools graduate about 100 kids a year. 100% of them get into university college, community college, or some technical school. And all but about five every year choose to go. And the minute the first class went, Doug hired a staff member full-time whose job was to get them through college. Now, that's a different model. That's not a typical school. There's all kinds of other models we need. Why don't we get them? Why aren't our public schools morphing into these alternative models to help these different kids? Well, bureaucracy. In the bureaucratic model that we created, again, in the 1800s, it wasn't done this way. It was entirely different. But toward the end of the 1800s, the early part of the 1900s, we created these large public school districts. And they own every building, and they employ every individual. They employ the teachers, the aides, the nurses, the custodians. And some of them, they even employ the bus drivers. 
and they have elected boards, school boards. And every one of those employees votes in school board elections, and their spouses vote, and their relatives vote, and not too many other people vote, because turnout at school board elections is often 15%. So the adults in the system have veto power. If there are changes that are inconvenient for them, and believe me, creating a school like Doug Ross's is very inconvenient for the teachers. His teachers are expected to, they have 16 or 17 kids in their family, and if that kid becomes homeless, they're expected to take them in until they can find a new home for them. They're expected to do whatever those 16 or 17 kids need. Well, that's inconvenient for most teachers. And so they don't want to go there. And there's all kinds of other things. If you move, if you really use technology, you'd have a school with fewer teachers and more aides who knew, knew computers and could help the kids with the technology. We ought to be doing that, but it's inconvenient for the adults. So it doesn't happen. So how do we create enough urgency that it will? Not with money, because the money's not there. We have to find another source of urgency. And other states have used customer choice. I live in Massachusetts. Our students do the best in the country on national tests, which we're very proud of. There's many reasons, most important of which is we have a lot of college-educated parents. It's socioeconomic. But in about 1993, we passed a big education reform bill, and it created public school choice statewide with the dollars following the child, and it created charter schools. I think we were the second or third state to do that. And it created some competition within the system. It made schools accountable to their customers. If I'm a principal and I know that you can take you Folks can all, if you're unhappy, take your kids elsewhere, and the money leaves with them, I'm going to listen very carefully to what you want, just like a business does in a competitive marketplace. The key is to create lots of choices. We haven't done enough of that in Massachusetts. You, and the easiest way to do that is charter schools, but there's lots of other models. There's magnet schools and all kinds of other ways to create different models, different choices for kids then to commit to closing the ones that don't work so that every teacher knows if we're not producing results, my job is at risk. So I'd better do whatever the principal, whatever I have to do to work with the principal to improve results in this building. You need to create enough alternatives so that, you know, it's open entry in a market so there's, there's enough places, enough seats for the kids to move to. If you don't have enough seats, then in a, in a choice system, you don't get much movement. But the studies, the academic studies of this say that once a school or district loses 3 to 5% of its students and money, the typical leader wakes up and starts to make changes because that's enough. And you all understand that. You lose, you, your revenues go down 3 to 5%. You pay attention. Imagine, imagine if you will, and this is not, not something Oregon's going to do tomorrow, but just imagine with me. Leave the old paradigm. And imagine a district which didn't employ any teachers or aides or custodians, a district that only contracted with operators, that's what a charter is, it's a contract, to run schools. And imagine that every three to five years, the performance contract, the charter ended, and if the school hadn't delivered the results that it promised in that performance contract, it was not renewed, and there was an open competition for that building, and every other operator could bid to operate a program in that building. Imagine that. Now, it's not just a dream because it's happening. It's happening. Washington, D.C. has a, two school boards, a traditional one and a charter school board. And in Louisiana, there is a state recovery school district that was created before Katrina, but when Katrina wiped out New Orleans schools, the recovery school district started creating charter schools. And now most schools in New Orleans are charter schools. Before Katrina, New Orleans had the worst public schools probably in the country. Dismal. They're now improving rapidly. Test scores every spring, the test scores are going up. People, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of ferment. Teach for America kids are flocking to New Orleans to teach in these kids, in these schools. 
Um, and there's a lot of excitement about public education in New Orleans. So.